Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. So I want to thank Chris and crew for inviting me here. It's very exciting. I've never had so many difficult acts to follow, including pretty much everybody in the audience, um, as we saw in the last session. And so I thought maybe a way to introduce myself to you folks, since I'm actually new to Gnome Dex, is to tell you some of my nicknames. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the nicknames I go by, because my husband bestowed this on me, is Hermione, because I guess I'm bossy and detail-oriented sometimes. That's a euphemism. Um, and a colleague of mine sometimes calls me the SAML lady, because uh, I was involved in the creation of the security assertion markup language, which has to do with digital identity. I'll be talking about some of those themes today. Uh, let's see, when I was growing up, my mom used to call me Last Word Annie when we were in an argument. Um, maybe that goes with the Hermione thing, I don't know. And, uh, but, but the thing that seems to have stuck most is XML Girl, and that's something I chose for myself. Um, and I've had it for, I don't know, eight years, and it seems to have stuck because I was, I was one of the folks who was involved in creating the XML standard. And so what I really am is a, a standards, open standards, open protocols, open data formats wonk. Uh, now, I have other nicknames that I'm going to choose not to share with you. After all, I hardly know you. Uh, and, and that's part of the point of wh what I'm here to talk about today. And I hope to offer some food for thought, both for people who consider themselves geeks and people who don't consider themselves geeks. And I've actually talked to many people over the last couple of days who, who don't consider themselves geeks, but, you know, rest assured, you know a lot about a lot of things. And, um, and I, I'll try and explain how the online world has a lot to offer to all of us. Uh, so, when I say the care and feeding of online relationships, I'm not actually talking about like match.com or eHarmony.com. I'm not talking about human to human. I'm talking about human to online or networked application relationships. Um, and I know there's actually a lot of people in the audience who uh, have companies that, that uh, offer uh, some online applications. And rumor has it there's a lot of people in the audience who are also human. So I figure, you know, we've got both sides covered here. And I want to talk about uh, the ways in which we uh, can try and make those relationships more equitable. And so what I mean, a, a hard, a, a concrete example of an online relationship like I'm talking about is everybody had to go make a badge to come here, right? And you were sent to pathable.com. I guess they're a sponsor, so there you go. And so you had to go online, share some information about yourself. You got to choose, some of it was optional, and you know, create an account and things like that, and that helped you make a badge and identify yourself here. So that's really the theme. Now, I want to start with a little hypothetical here that I call the Shredder Saga. Uh, so even if you're the kind of person who spends your life on camera, a few people we know do that, <laughs> you still have the right and still may want to uh, limit how much of your personal information you share with the rest of the world. And so we want to talk about the control that you have over information that you fully own. And often the word that gets used is privacy, and privacy gets equated to anonymity. We're really talking about control and respect of your data, not so much perfect anonymity necessarily. So I have this little shredder saga uh, that has you imagine that you have decided you need to shred a bunch of paper that has been accumulating because you know that there's a risk of identity theft and fraud, it's receipts, it's old bills, uh, maybe you did some backup CDs in the past that are now just kind of stale and you want to get rid of them and you want to shred those as well. So you go to a store, you know, I don't know, Staples, or I should use hypotheticals, uh, Staplers, or OfficeArmory.com or something, and you go to the store, <laughs> just making it up, and you know that you want a shredder with a certain capacity that can handle CDs and so on, they happen to be out. It's a you know, bricks and mortar store, they can't carry everything in the store, so you think, aha, I'll just go online. I know the kind of thing I want, I'll go online. So you go online, you add something to a cart over at staplers.com, and when you go to check out, you're presented with a whole bunch of pretty much required information that you have to supply, and you can understand why. You know, if you were to go into a big box store and pay cash, it's essentially anonymous to all intents and purposes. But online, it's an attenuated world compared to the world of atoms. So the world of bits requires you to supply information so that they can get the item to you. It requires you to supply information that they can actually use to get payment. 
So you end up supplying your address and your phone number because you know FedEx or whoever requires the phone number to contact you. And you end up supplying a credit card uh, and its expiration date and its security code. And here, I've, you, it's a tiny little example. I don't know if you can see it. My slides will be up publicly. I'll, I'll put that on my site after, after I'm done here. Um, and so uh, sometimes you'll have a password reminder or security question that might ask the city you were born in or you know, your date of birth, your first pet's name, that sort of thing. Um, and so you end up having to give a lot of information to be able to achieve the act of getting a shredder from them to you <laughs> in exchange for some money. Now, as part of that process, you have to accept that site's terms of use. And if you look carefully at it, um, some of them are onerous, some of them are less so, but you pretty much have to consider those terms of use at the point when you're most excited about getting your shredder, or most impatient, or most annoyed that you had to go through five steps to get your shredder. Um, and often, I, I actually did, you know, I'll expose it at staples.com, that I went and looked at their privacy policy and their terms of use, and they do have ways to opt out of certain ways that by default they're gonna use your information. And you have to like send email to one address and you have to send snail mail to another address and eventually you can achieve that. So it's possible to do um, in most cases, but it could be onerous. Now, there's a price that we pay for online service like this. And when I say price, I'm not trying to say that's something bad. You know, I'm not here to say, oh, damn the man, you know, it's very bad that we have companies trying to sell us stuff we want. Well, no, it's good. And a lot of us here work for or have started companies or, you know, have companies that, you know, put the food on our table. And so another way of thinking of the price individuals pay is the business models that companies use in order to get, you know, to make it sustainable for them. And so often we pay money, uh, often we pay eyeball time, attention for ads or something like that. And increasingly, we're paying in data, we're giving information about ourselves. And honestly, there's some applications that work best when, they, when we teach them about us. Uh, there's some applications that don't work at all unless we teach them about us, like who our friends are and what our likes and dislikes are, or, um, or, or uploading photos that we've taken, for example. So it could be sort of, you can think of it as metadata about us, or also content that we've created that we've been part of. So how is all this data put to use? And I would posit to you that there's sort of two big spheres where the data is quite obviously and legitimately put to use. And one of them is digital identity management. What I mean by that is the setting up of an account for you of various types, the recording of certain data about you so that when you come back, you either get personalized service or you get access controlled service or whatever. You know, you don't want people logging into your, your bank account um, who aren't you. So the jobs that this data does for you in digital identity management includes identifying you to one scope or another. Um, and to do that, you need to be authenticated. So authentication is kind of a technical term, means essentially logging in by one means or another. Passwords are often used. Um, and let me say something about identification. You know, when it comes to lots of purposes for online applications, uh, they don't need to know exactly who they are. You know, the, we hear the saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a, a dog. But for some of these applications, they just want to know you're the same dog as last time. So it's, you could use a fake name. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, for, for staplers.com, it does matter because it's connected to the credit card and they have to sort of validate the credit card and, and so on. So they know your real name. Um, so authorization is good if it's your bank account. Authorization is good if you're logging in into, as an employee to your payroll app. Um, and personalization is obviously good in all these cases if it's recording your preferences, aisle versus window. Uh, if you're listening to Pandora, I'll admit I like Queen and Aerosmith. That's really dating me. Um, and then <laughs> online social networking, not to belabor this point, really has two big uses for the information. One is connectedness, and what I mean by that is the feeling that you're connected to other people. The point is human-to-human -human relationships in that case, but you're having to share information with the application in order for them to help you achieve that. And then the second thing here is collaboration, and I mean that quite uh, literally and rationally. You know, if you're on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn and you have a question for your, your crew, you can sort of put out a question and get an answer. Or many of the photos that I actually used for this presentation I found on Flickr, and I just have to put in a plug for Flickr's great uh, advanced search capabilities where they use Creative Commons and I can make sure to 
not steal photos or illustrations that other people made, but use them legitimately because they let me know that. Um, so those are two great uses for this information, which I characterize as differentiated application behavior based on permissioned data sharing. You have to want to give it to them. And so the ideal is to have it be perfectly differentiated for your needs based on perfectly permissioning them to have it. Now there's some other use of data, which I've categorized as cruft here at the bottom. Uh, have you guys heard of the concept of a digital shadow? The digital footprint is kind of all the information that we know we put out there, and then the digital shadow is kind of all the information about us we didn't know we put out there. And that, uh, what was it, move to panama.com that we heard yesterday uh, in the search talk. Um, there's stuff you didn't know could be put together to uniquely identify you. And the, the term of art in the industry is PII, personally identifiable information. And you may think that by sharing just a zip code and just uh, an income range, you can't identify yourself uniquely. But there are people who can do it to a fair degree of certainty. So sometimes we don't even know that we're giving up a lot of information about ourselves, but it's out there. Simply walking through one of these rooms and being captured on camera, and maybe with facial recognition, somebody's putting two and two together and getting your bank account number. <laughs> So these are things we have to be cautious about. Oh, one more note about the sort of digital identity management world versus the social networking world. There are even some studies out to show that the social networking world does not really put a premium on privacy. People readily share information, whereas the, the business of identity management, IDM sometimes called, uh, is largely about protecting privacy to the extent possible. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle. Uh, so <laughs> most of us haven't experienced uh, an identity theft or fraud uh, event, some of us might have, but all of us experience some pains, some issues, so to speak, that, <laughs> that go along with human application relationships. So I was kind of thinking of that, that sitcom, Just Shoot Me. <laughs> Miriam picked up on that right away <laughs> when I was telling her I had this fake magazine cover. Um, here are some of the problems that we experience, I think all of us. Are we giving too much? Are we giving too much information because we're kind of over a barrel when we're asked for the information. Uh, a lot of times we're just, oh, you know, I went to Office Armory and they asked me for this thing, but, you know, staplers.com is just as bad, so I'll just, you know, I have no choice, I'll give it to you anyway. Um, one of the things we do, by the way, in, in perhaps passive aggressive protest about that is that we lie, right? And to me, the evidence that they didn't need to ask it is if it's okay to lie and there's no consequences to you if, you if you don't tell them the truth. Whereas if you give them a fake name and they check it against the credit card and the credit card validation fails, that makes a difference and they really do need to know and maybe we can figure out a way they don't, but okay. Second thing is, well, how do you build trust with, say, e-commerce sites, sites that are actually asking you for money for some service or good? Um, I was trying to dig up the research. I saw some research recently and I lost it, should have bookmarked it, that had to do with the fact that people in the US are much more readily willing to share information about themselves to get interesting service online. Whereas people, for example, in Germany are not. Uh, it's just their culture. And that's cool. But what this study that I was looking at was suggesting was that it's quite possible that one of the reasons for uh, the robuster, more robust economy that we see here is that we're willing to sort of have that exchange of data for value. Whereas in Germany, maybe other places, not so much. And it actually contributes to economic growth to do it. Well, okay, so how can we make that better and more successful and build in the expectation of trust and, and the likelihood of trustworthiness for people who are skittish even here, just anywhere around the world? Stale data. Well, you know, it is pretty annoying when you have to give your address to all these sites and then you move. Um, you know, you've basically given them some, some data by value, to use a sort of technical term. Uh, and that's kind of inconvenient. How much time should you be spending registering for a new relationship with a new site? Uh, how much time should you spend on, on the care and feeding of what you do with that site? You know, do they send you a monthly newsletter? Do you want it? Do you have trouble unsubscribing from it? You know, those are some of the pains that we all feel. And then finally, what's going on behind your back? If you look closely at some of these privacy policies, you might just think, oh, geez. <laughs> You know, I had no idea they could legitimately <laughs> use my information that way because I let them, because I accepted the terms of use. Now, 
I wanted to introduce you to a relatively new, a newish concept called vendor relationship management. It's actually about two years old, but it's getting quite a lot of currency now. If you're familiar with the customer relationship management, or CRM, it's about how you as a vendor can do a better job of capturing and retaining customers by saving up information about them and doing a better job for them by selling them stuff. So for example, you know, the kind of uh, recommendations that you get on e-commerce sites. Oh, you bought this in the past, you might be interested in that. Others like you bought this in the past, you might be interested in that. So CRM is really about retaining information about you explicitly. The idea behind vendor relationship management is for you to be able to manage all the vendors in your life. And <laughs> it's, really, it's really sort of an obvious idea when you think about it, but it's quite clever. And, and the guy who came up with it is Doc Searles, the Clue Train Manifesto guy. Um, and the Clue Train Manifesto's first item, its first of its 95 theses was, markets are conversations. And the basic message there is very similar to some of the things we were saying about PR in the last session. Uh, you know, you, you really can't fake sincerity anymore. You have to be sincere and you have to offer something, something of value. And um, vendor relationship management, or VRM, is, we hope, a way to achieve that, to achieve more sincerity and more trustworthiness between people and the online applications that serve them. So here's a little bit more information about VRM. There is a projectvrm.org that Doc Searles runs. It's at the Harvard University Berkman Center, and I've pretty recently gotten involved with that. And this quote here is directly from the, the wiki that that uh, link takes you to. Provides customers with tools for engaging with vendors in ways that work for both parties. This isn't about trying to sort of say, I'm going this way and I'm a customer and hey, vendors, follow me. And the vendors are like, no, not going to work. It's got to be a partnership and it's got to work for both sides. So really what we're talking about when you add up all the arrows is a big graph. Um, and there's this icon that I can't remember who designed it called the rel button, standing for relationship that shows VRM and CRM getting together and people have proposed use cases of, well, a site could put, you know, sort of a broken pair of these sort of things that look like magnets to show that they are VRM friendly or VRM ready or enabled. And then when you set up a relationship with them, perhaps they sort of link up. But I think I haven't seen any sort of real stuff to back that up yet. It's, it's good ideas, but it's ideas so far. So let's now, with the help of Otto Bunny, Otto Bunny is the bunny of a friend of mine, um, Reimagine the Shredder Saga with VRM in the picture. Are there better ways to set up a, to go back to that human to human romantic relationship language, healthy, mutually respectful data sharing relationship with a site? And so some things that I would suggest to you that might help the situation include, for one, making consent that you offer to them be meaningful. And that takes some doing, because right now it's a lot more like a, Yes, dear, <laughs> then, uh, yes, I agree, I, you know, that's something I want to sign up for. And I have a choice, and I chose yes, and isn't that good for you? Um, and another possible way to imagine things being better is that it's a two-way relationship. They want to impose some policies on me, well, what if I want to impose some policies on them? Like, there are certain sites I don't want them further sharing my information with. And a third is, which I forgot, Ah, yes, and I'll talk about it more in a second. How do we uncouple all that relationship management, which, you know, if you're in a human relationship, you might call it processing, or, you know, you have to go out for a coffee and work things out. How about we uncouple that with the actual act of data sharing? So I'll talk, to, talk about that more in a second. Another question for you. What if you don't want a long relationship? You just want a one-night stand with staplers.com. You know, don't call me in the morning. <laughs> Um, and, and I actually, I, I brainstormed this with some of my VRM colleagues because I was talking to my boss about, you know, relationship management. He said, look, I don't want a relationship with all these sites. They're just not that important to me. I want to be able to just use them and walk away. <laughs> and so I came up with this phrase, one night stand, which sounds very horrible. But, you know, brainstorming it is actually quite useful. You start imagining, well, what if it were really easy to walk up to staplers.com get them the information they need, knowing that I can trust them to do the right thing with it, and then walk away and have that relationship that had to be built to order the shredder, just sort of tear it down pretty quickly. Um, and, and know that it was done in a way that was accountable so that I could, say, take them to court if I find that they violated the agreement. I think one landmark case like that would have wide-ranging effects, actually. 
So that's another possibility. Another thing to imagine, well, knowing that you wanted to buy a shredder with these capabilities, have to be able to shred CDs, how could you have engaged differently with all the vendors who are offering shredders that, ha that do that? And I'll tell you, I actually went and did some searches, including on some of these sites that, you know, claim to be, well, we're aggregators of things you can buy and we'll send you to the best site for the best price. And none of them gave me any useful hits on shredding CDs. So what if you could put out what the VRM crowd calls a personal RFP to say, here's what I'm looking for, here's the price I'm willing to buy it at, who wants to meet my terms? That'd be pretty cool. Another way that you can engage with the entire class of vendors is to know what kind of support, customer support qualities you're looking for. I hate long wait times if I have to call them, or I'm willing to wait longer if uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll listen to your ad, but you can put me on the slow line. I don't really care. I'm home today and I can just put on speaker. <laughs> um, another one somebody came up with somewhat fancifully was, well, you know, just the same way that you go to sites that say, customers like you bought this thing, I could say, vendors like you who sold me this might also be able to sell me this other thing. Um, it really actually turns it up, once you turn CRM on its head and make it VRM, you already feel empowered. And I think, you know, there's a so certain social aspect to demanding these things that can help. Um, and then finally, is it possible to get a good handle on all the places your data is going? Imagine if you had something like a Google Analytics page that showed you where you sent information about yourself. It would probably be very, very sobering, but that's, you know, that's the first step to recovery or something like that. Um, so I want to say a little bit more about that uncoupling idea of the relationship management to the sharing of data. And here is the main point I want to make. And this uh, reflects a, a use case set, a set of use cases that the VRM folks have been delving into quite deeply, which is the personal address manager or change of address set of use cases. So let's say, since I just showed you a magazine earlier, let's talk about, you know, you're subscribing to Human Application Relationships Quarterly or something. And they need to have your address so that they can mail you the paper magazine every month. So there's some sort of thing they have to do with your address every month. And they, of course, want your real address. If you think about the crazy wait times for paper magazines, it takes four to six weeks to change an address. It's crazy. Well, what are the times that given your druthers, you'd like to actually go to their website. Well, you know, maybe they had an online survey that was cool in the January issue, so you go and check it out, and then you go back again because you want to see the results of other people filling out the survey, but then it doesn't occur to you to go there again until April. Problem is, you move to a new house in March sometime. What you want to be able to do is change your address record once somewhere and have the magazine publisher pick it up. Now, there's another kind of act that you might want to do, which is, you know, Human ap Application Relationships Quarterly just entered into this uh, uh, deal with, uh, I don't know, Red Bull, and you don't like Red Bull, <laughs> and you decide that you don't want your data shared with the Red Bull company, whatever it is, and so you want to go in and sort of res and say, well, look, you know, I told you that you could use my data for thus and such, but I actually want to restrict that. That's really a two-way relationship. So that's one of the reasons I really feel that you want to uncouple those acts as best you can to reflect what people would really rather do. Aha. So I want to start thinking about solution spaces here. That was all problem space. And I've put in a shameless plug for my band, <laughs> Mud Junket. And I realized only yesterday when we saw the proto lolcat hang in their baby that I think it's the same font, um, which pretty much tells you the kind of music that we play. <laughs> but if you're local and you're free on September 27th, come and see us at Celtic Bayou in Redmond. Anyway. Um, <laughs> That was a sh totally shameless plug. <laughs> um, so the example I want to present is something that just occurred to me, and I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it, but I think it's very evocative, which is the kind of calendar sharing, online calendar sharing, that we do today. Um, and so one of the things that we do, so I've got a little picture of my Google Calendar. Uh, for, for Mud Junket, we manage our, our practice schedule on Google. And so share this calendar. That's how I make my calendar publishable. Well, that's interesting because it means that, you know, Google is always sitting there ready to serve up that calendar to, to people who want to see that calendar. But, of course, I do, do only share that calendar with specific people, namely the band. Nobody else gets to see our practice schedule, and that's a really important part of it. So that data is always there, ready to be picked up by specific people, the band. Now, at the same time, on my little MacBook Pro here, I've got, you know, iCal running. And I've got other calendars, like my work calendar. You know, I've got appointments during the day and such. And I want to also publish that. 
So some interesting things that I have to do when it's on my laptop, which isn't always on the net, is publish it to a place. I happen to use calgoo.com because they're free. Um, and I publish limited amount of information and I publish it on a web server somewhere so that I can subscribe to it or let people who are uh, legitimately allowed to subscribe to it. So here at the bottom you see my iCal panel for what calendars I publish and subscribe to. Um, and so what's interesting to me about that is it's uncoupling the relationship stuff, like what I'm sharing and on what terms and who gets to see it, from the actual data. And the data is always there to be pulled whether I'm around or not or whether this laptop is online or not. And I made sure that it was offline now so that it wouldn't be getting annoying Twitter interruptions. <laughs> Um, so, to me, this calendaring example is reminiscent of an idea that's come up in the VRM world, which is called feeds-based VRM. I've got a link there to a proposal that's been made about essentially a personal data store. Maybe you could sort of hook it up with an add-in, uh, with a plug-in to your blog, um, that would hold things like your address and other data. And the idea is that you'd have an Atom feed um, that you would set up to be available you'd sort of customize one feed per site that you want to have your information. And just like with Google Calendar, you would generate a magic secret URL that you would give them to use that permissions them to get the data you've selected for them. And so they can subscribe and pull your data when they need it. Like if they're a magazine publisher, they'll pull your address. And if your address changes, they just pull it. It's uncoupled, the setting and the getting. And then if you decide you don't like them, you can just break the URL, make it not work anymore. Very interesting stuff. There's some people working on this, but I don't know the status of implementation of this. I myself think that it works even without the Atom piece, but I'll be interested to see where they go with this. So other VRMesh behavior that we've seen uh, in the wild includes, I would say, the next step up in complexity and interestingness, user-driven data services. So people are probably familiar with Fire Eagle, which, you know, in, within which you can set your location, and then it hooks up using the OAuth protocol to a number of other applications that have said they accept that connection. So that you can, for example, and I've done this, you know, I've got my Fire Eagle thing where I just said, you know, today I'm in Kirkland, today I'm in Seattle, and it hooks up to something like Doppler, which will take that as input. Now, OAuth is interesting because it gives you a modicum of security um, around that kind of applications talking to each other about you on your behalf in a permissioned way. And I've got a bunch of other examples here Health examples, payment examples, both of those are very high value. It has to do with health records that you want to be private or money that you want to not give to people you don't want to give it to. Um, and I just wanted to mention one more in the location area. Uh, Simlabs is a company that has what's called a geolocation server and it happens to use Liberty protocols, Liberty Alliance protocols, which is kind of the next step up in complexity if you need to turn all your security and privacy knobs to 11, so to speak which some people do sometimes, don't they? <laughs> Even people who live their lives on camera. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just give a flavor of all the different ideas that are out there. So another thing that I think may be very promising is this notion of something called R cards or relationship cards. And um, you may be familiar with Microsoft's innovation around something they call information cards, info cards. Uh, it's an idea for sharing your identity with multiple websites. And the folks on Project Higgins, which is an open source effort at Eclipse, um, have created this open source identity selector, which is something conforming to the, the info card protocol. And the idea is that it's a relationship card that you and I've taken some screenshots from their demo, and I've got a link on the page. If you go get my slides later, you can see this interesting demo from this company doing stuff with Higgins. Um, basically demonstrating that you share data with, I think they use a hypothetical United Airlines. They should have called it untied just to be safe like I'm being. Um, anyway, um, and you can change your address on your side and they can change your uh, miles in your mile bank on the other side and it's sort of in one record that, that uh, reflects the policies that you share together. Um, so if you want to take that idea of personal data services, so now the, you, the human to online application relationship has just become you acting through an online application as your agent with another online application. That's how you make it more two-way. And so this is a much more um, functional, a little bit more complex model that gets us to new levels of functionality. So let's say you order a shredder. I changed it here to officearmory.com. And if you're using the Liberty Protocols, which, which I should mention, there's an open source implementation of these at openliberty.org if you want to check them out. Um, 
the first thing that you do to Office Armory is you don't actually give it any information. What you do is you give it a pointer to your discovery service, which is like your personal information hub. And the discovery service helps Office Armory find out how, basically how to get money directly from your payment service, which, you know, could be, uh, PayPal is a good example of something today that lets you keep your credit card information private from all the places you use it. Um, and it can also pick up your preferred shipping service. And interestingly, if you let it do that, there's no cross leakage of your real name necessarily, your address, the purchase details, or even the payment details. So you've now got, let's say it's PayPal. PayPal doesn't need to know what's in the box. They don't need to know where it's going. They don't need to know who you are. Uh, let's say you picked FedEx for shipping. They could supply a kind of scrambled label on the box. They don't need to know what's in the box either. They don't need to know your real name, technically. And they don't need to know what credit card you use to make the purchase. Office Armory even doesn't need to know. All they need to know is that you want a shredder and you've arranged for payment. They don't even need to know where you are or who you are. So if you want that privacy set to 11, there's an architecture out there that can actually satisfy it. Um, and a really interesting part of this architecture is that it's got a thing called an interaction service. So let's say the site, you know, looks at the order and they say, oh geez, you know, we just got the shredder in, in pink, red, and black, and we didn't get the information from her about which one she wants. Or we have to ask her for consent to share her information with some other outsourced company that we work with. So we gotta go contact her. So the interaction service says, how you wanna be contacted when the service needs to ping you. So usually you with your browser have to go to the site, which is a pain. In this case, they can come to you and maybe it's SMSing you and you can just say yes or no. Um, so all of these things are really interesting. The most interesting question of all, given that we have a technical architecture that seems to satisfy a lot of interesting requirements is, could we actually see this ecosystem grow up in the wild? In fact, that's the question for all of them, I think. Um, we've got, you know, sort of a, a, a data, almost a live streaming that's machine readable model with feeds, and then we have a personal data services model. Now, some of you might be wondering where OpenID fits in. I mentioned OAuth, and OAuth and OpenID are all, uh, seem to be discussed in the same breath a lot these days. They really do different things, and I think Chris wanted me to explain this just a little a bit, so I will. Um, OAuth is really, it's almost a web services technology that, as I said, allows, web, uh, allows the services online to talk about you with your permission. So a classic example would be either Fire Eagle talking to Doppler or, um, you know, having your photo service talk to your chosen photo printing service by arrangement. So you get to choose which service you want. OpenID is more about identification at this stage, I would say, than this data sharing. And I want to talk about two aspects of OpenID. And by the way, that, that open ID there up there at the top with sun.com, uh, sun is engaged in this open ID at work initiative, we call it, and that's something that my group did. If you're interested, you can go to openid.sun.com and read about it. Um, so for logging in, that's what open ID has strength in right now, I would say. Uh, open IDs, I think, could be used with any of the data sharing models that I've presented. It's sort of orthogonal, to use a fancy word. Um, so could any other kind of ID, whether it's, you know, just a siloed ID, you know, some local account that I set up with staplers or Office Armory or whatever, or whether it's, you know, something fancier, we're using SAML technology or something else. I think all of these systems could be compatible with whatever we choose here for our future of, of uh, healthy and mutually respectful relationships. Now, OpenID does have a capability for, it's called a simple registration in one version and attribute exchange in another. Um, that's, uh, well, in the first case, it's like n a list of nine things you can share. In the other case, it's more generalized. And it scares me a little bit, I'll tell you. Even among that list of nine, one of them is date of birth, which some people do want to keep secret. And I think there continue to be extra security and privacy implications for using OpenID to share information like this. Um, I had largely unseen in the wild, and then just last week I saw one service that went up using it. Although what you need is, again, an ecosystem. So I think it's an interesting question to see if that's gonna be the way. And maybe we need to sort of join OpenID as one method of identification along with this other share, uh, data sharing model. So what are the challenges? Uh, somebody uh, on the VRM list pointed out this great phrase, customer roach motel. Um, you know, it's all about customer capture, really. <laughs> 
And, you know, they don't want customers to check out. I think it'd be good business for the one night stand model if I could walk up to any website and find out that I can sort of, you know, meet and greet, go straight to what it is we want to do, and then part theoretically never to see each other again. I'd be likelier to go back there the next day when I need something else. So to me, it's, you know, if you love a thing, set it free, right? <laughs> Um, it's scary. It's scary to contemplate that, and I can see that. And so we're not going to get anywhere as individuals if we freeze vendors out of the equation. I think that's manifestly true based on vendors having called the shots till now because they're the ones investing in infrastructure and so on. So I didn't put the, the name of the person who, who had this quote out. It is from a conference that's going to, I think, happen soon. Um, I didn't want to sort of embarrass them. To me, I cannot believe the sentence that, you know, However, powerful social networking forces are leading customers to turn to their own communities for answers, pricing, and more, and this undercuts projects to improve customer experience. Oh my god. Um, I think it, it's, I hope that it's just sort of a typo or something, but I, I fear that it's an example of somebody really not getting it. This is a CRM expert saying this. Um, we've got to do some, we've got to do better, right? And we have to do better by realizing we're all in this together. So, that's one big challenge. Another challenge is there are natural technical asymmetries that have to be solved here, and I'll briefly list them. One is browser to web server, not the same technology when you're going to a site to say register. Another is human to big company. And a third is if we're looking to this model of finding agents to represent us, like Calgoo does for my calendar, the data sharing relationship that I have with custodians of my data is largely silent. There's not a lot of terms of use there, not even as much as with staplers.com. Um, and we need to make that explicit. And I've written a lot in recent uh, months about this usability and the effic efficiency imperative and the self-revelation imperative. And I'm, I'm just going to let that sit there. And you can go and check out my website for further thoughts on that. But essentially, if things don't work really, really quickly and do what we want, we'll just ignore them or you know, route around them as failures. Um, so my question to you, my biggest question to you, is could it be that this is what mutually respectful data sharing looks like? And I've got a, a Venn diagram here. I sort of became notorious a little bit for this thing called the Venn of identity. If you Google that, you'll probably find me easily. Um, talking about SAML and OpenID and info card technologies and comparing and contrasting them. And so what I see as really interesting about the digital identity management world, the online social networking world, and the possibilities of the VRM world is that they all share this this proposition of differentiated application behavior based on permission data sharing. And so I've got a few new use cases to think about here. So we talked about uh, the business guy says thanks for the shipping address to the individual guy. Well, what if two individuals could do this the same? I mean, you kind of can do it with Flickr, but you know, the terms of use are not as clear. What if each one wants to share certain holiday photos with certain people? Um, what if you get a feed customized for you from a company that you deal with, a vendor you deal with? So for example, you know, I sure would like to see my credit report activity, which I currently pay $6.95 a month for, as a feed from Equifax. That would be really cool. Um, and in fact, what, what was the last night we came up with another use case? I would like to give a very detailed feed of my travel activity to my credit card company so that they'll know ahead of time, rather than when I'm trying to check out of the hotel and they think it's really weird that I'm in Belgium, um, and they're wondering if it's a fake, you know, somebody using my card illegitimately, well, they'll know it was really me. That was my plan. Um, you could have business people doing the same thing. Differentiated behavior based on permission data sharing. Well, maybe they get catalogs that way, too, catalog prices or something. And then finally, we might see these new social and economic models where, let's say, uh, a, cus a, a vendor finds out about your fine wine preferences by this means. You just sort of keep a feed of all the wines you've tried or want to try, and they pick that up, and they suggest to you new wines or a wine rack or something. So uh, I hope I've left time to give it inter make it interactive. And what I've tried to do is I'm going to make this an A and Q. And these are questions I want to ask you. So what about this vision appeals? What's scary on both sides? What's your password? Kidding. Um, <laughs> it works, even with IT professionals, right? So, um, so here are my questions to you, especially are you interested in offering help? And I see a hand right up there, if I can ask the uh, microphone people. We have about five minutes, I think. Thank you.
got a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, you said if you don't want to keep a relationship with a certain vendor with your feed, you just break the URL. Well, my idea, my, my thought was that you were saying it would be one URL that many vendors would read, so that would break it for all of them, which seems to go back to why not just fill out their form and tell them all these different things. It kind of doesn't really, goes back to the first problem. There, there's a couple of things there. First of all, you didn't ask this question, but I want to sort of put it out there. If we compare apples to apples, we've given, even in a future where we give them a feed to pull information when they need it, um, which theoretically has the advantages of, you know, now they don't have so much data protection liability and there's privacy laws and stuff. They're just sort of caching it temporarily. They'll still have it and they could, you know, be illegal and, and save it permanently. So that's one thing. Another thing is the idea is that it's a per relationship feed. So even if you all give them the same information, it's a different URL per. Just like if you um, share your calendar, if you go to Google Calendar and you want to share it with this person and that person, the other person, um, well, actually, no, in that case, it just gives you the same private URL, doesn't it? So it's a shared secret that gets, you know, shared secrets are actually not very good for security. So the idea is, indeed, and I, I encourage you to go look at that FeedSpace VRM paper, the idea is one URL per relationship. The other thing is that um, companies, you know, they're incentivized to do the opposite. They want to get everything from you and not give it away. They don't, like LinkedIn, for example, you join, it's hard to, 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 to unjoin. Indeed. And that's the model, I mean, we're faced with that building our own businesses, yep. do we want to make it hard for people to quit the subscription to yep. follow most other companies and to play by a, a higher standard, a more ethical standard is actually to uh, put yourself yep. at a disadvantage. I think there are incentives that may not be outweighed by the perceived risks for them right now. And one of the incentives is fresh data. I mean, if they send stuff to the wrong address, they often incur costs if they ship you something, for example. The other is, as I mentioned, da data liability. Uh, data protection liability, which is pretty severe in some cases. So, you know, if they lose a laptop and they lose a lot of data, rather than pointers to data that you're, that, you know, a malicious person isn't uh, authorized to access, you know, it could cost them real money. So that's one opportunity. Um, that, that's what I hope. I mean, we, having the conversation, I think, and we have a bunch of vendors in the room, I think can help because it's, um, it can be a competitive advantage if individual customers deem it so. Um, and what was the other thing I want to say? Oh, about dataportability.org has, has a sort of, you know, maybe a role to play here too. One of the things that dataportability.org has been working on is how to make information exportable and importable between essentially social networks. I personally think that almost isn't ambitious enough. I don't want it exportable and importable. Ideally, I want to be able to hang on to it and give them a pointer to it when I see fit and then rescind that right if I don't see fit anymore and I want to switch networks somehow. Absolutely fascinating, um, especially that last point. But I want to go back to the VRM because that point that you put up from the CRM expert yeah. was fascinating because yeah. we could all go out there and say, here's our personal RFP, here's our VRM system, and they don't play, the whole thing doesn't work. That's out. right. So how do you see um, these VRM marketplaces actually just starting? You know, I've been witnessing a lot of startups taking part in VRM conversations. Now, obviously, you know, everybody's looking for an exit strategy, right? Um, I don't hold that against them. You know, I'm not a damn the man kind of person myself. I actually love capitalism, I'll tell you right at the front. Um, and there's a lot of people trying to sort of commoditize that ability to get information and provide value on top of that. You know, we see this continued sedimentation of what counts as value add, right? And so it sort of gets commoditized and then you've got to build the next interesting thing. And there's a bunch of people, this gives me an opportunity to hit a point I, I meant to earlier, which is here are some other VRM use cases. User-driven search, which I think we heard some ideas that were similar to that yesterday, the idea where your search result and your search terms are yours. And you may very well want to sort of reuse them, save them, sort of aggregate them with other people. So seeing information and data as yours, that's, that's been a passion of mine pretty much forever. You know, I was an old SGMLer before we did XML. It's about making data formats that the creators of information actually own so as to take away from vendors the right to lock them in. Um, so to me, that's really important, and the only way I know to, uh, to excite enough people across that spectrum is to talk about the business advantages of it, right? That's my hope. Hi, this is really terrific. This is one of the best explanations I've seen on VRM in a presentation. It really seems like VRM is really starting to come into its day, so this is really I think so. awesome. And, you know, one of the questions I had was like about third-party <laughs> verification services that fit into VRM systems and yep. that seems to really play to you know what's happening right now with so many different applications and microformats and the ability to 
You know, you use a lot of different types of, you know, sharing, data sharing yep. in, in, in many, many different ways, in many, many different layers, too. Yes. And so, just curious your take, your, your thoughts on the sure. third-party verification service. Yes, that. that is like, actually, so there's a really, one of the reasons that these huge identity architectures have grown up is to solve the problem, the hard problem. They went right to the hardest problem of third-party asserted information about you, really. I think they're applicable in terms of their privacy and security features for information that you own about you directly. Like, I'm authoritative for my address, pretty much. I mean, there's no government entity that really tells me. I gotta tell them when I moved, pretty much. Um, but my credit score, so, you know, property is a bundle of rights, and intellectual property around information is a bundle of rights, so, you know, I have the right, I think, to read my credit score, but I don't have the right to poke an entry, you know, to change it. <laughs> um, and so third party, whoops, third party asserted information like that is exactly one of the harder use cases. So imagine in a VRM world that you get a feed from Equifax that has your credit report activity and your credit score in it, signed by them so that if you mess with it, you break it, and then you can hand it out on request. Basically, it's a required piece of information, perhaps, for somebody down the line. This is a little info card-like, if you're familiar with that model, but there's many different architectures that can satisfy it. So that now imagine you've got, if you've got, say, a blog plugin that does this for you, helps you do it, you start to have the glimmer of personal data analytics engine, because you can see it flowing even if you don't have the right to change the information. And that, and that would be the ability for user search Yeah, user-driven search would also be part of that, yeah. I think, well, there's always, uh, on the one hand, I was gonna say there's always a need for new data formats. On the other hand, one of my jokes is that there are no hypothetical markup languages anymore. They all exist. <laughs> so the problem is that we have too many. Uh, it, it, it used to be a joke. I think that was it. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. I'm happy to talk about this later. <laughs>